to that, can't you see? I was out on the circuit. I'd just completed a qualifying run, and I was coming in. I saw a car in the mirrors coming you know, very, very quickly indeed. I realized that uh, there was a car on a qualifying lap. It was black. There was the familiar yellow helmet in, in my mirror, so, so it was Senna on a, a committed lap. I gave him all the space I had, and he came through, and it was in the part of the circuit at Brands Hatch, Dingle Dell, out of Westfield Bend, down into Dingle Dell, then up Dingle Dell into Dingle Dell Corner. And something, I mean, I just sat there gobsmacked because I'd done what I'd done, um, wherever it was in the grid, and here was a guy in a car, and that car to me was dancing. It was like rain just dancing off a pavement. He had control of the car, yet he had the car running in a way was just, I thought, well, there's a clear signal if there ever needed one to say that my time as a Grand Prix driver effectively was finished because I realized at that point, here's a man doing things which I hadn't even thought of, let alone put into effect. Sixty-five pole positions, 41 Grand Prix wins, world champion in 88, 90 and 91. He was awarded every accolade in the sport, including that of the greatest driver of his generation. A lot is known about his achievements, but it's hard to comprehend the single-minded dedication that took him to the top. It made him a millionaire many times over. It made him the hero that Brazilians were desperate for. Self-confident, self-absorbed, and there'd be times in his Grand Prix career when he'd show a reckless self-belief behind the wheel. Ten years ago, Formula One had clearly found its new star. Tolman provided his entry point into Grand Prix racing. Lotus provided the breakthrough. In 1985, a supreme victory in the wet of Estoril. But many wins on British racetracks had gone before as the young Brazilian progressed through the junior categories of Formula Ford and Formula 3. I remember when I first met him, it was in the race at Nürburgring when they had all these new Mercedes and they had all drivers you could think of, Fangio and Bramble, I mean, everybody was there from Australia and from America and so on. And who won it? A guy I'd never heard of, who, who, like uh, this man called Senna. And I said, well, what's he do? And the 70s said, well, he's in Formula Ford or whatever, I can't remember what it was now. And yet he started there, and, and from that moment he, he just continued to rise until, of course, he got to where he was, a, a position that is, in my opinion, only, only equal, probably, maybe by Fangio. true but I start with four years old in go-kart my my father made a special one very small model and uh, up to 30 years old I was just going around going around practicing I enjoy very much always motor racing last year was my first season in, in cars and single single seaters I never been I never tried before it's too cold for him over here that was the main problem. Um, he would never really get out of bed to lunchtime to test. And then he refused to actually go out until his gloves were put on the radiators to warm them up. He'd had a lot of grounding in carts. He had his first cart when he was four and a half. His father bought it. And it was just easy for him. He could come into the pits at any time and say that the right-hand front tyre needed a pound more pressure. He didn't have to worry about the steering wheel and the gear lever and stuff that a lot of other people have to worry about. Well, on top of the results he was piling up almost every weekend, he was a very motivated young man, a bit different to his colleagues of, of a similar age. Uh, he lived in the Reading area at that time, which meant he was only about five or eight miles from my home. So I think my wife and I took him out for dinner half a dozen times in 1983, try to make him feel a bit more at home. 
in that part of the world and in our conversations, which I think tended to make my wife a little bit bored. It was only about motor racing. It came across how intense he was about his career. British motorsport first saw Senna involved in intense competition in 1983. His rivalry with the young Martin Brundle, making the British Formula 3 championship that year a classic. Brundle went well in the second half of the season, but Senna had dominated the first half with a record nine straight wins. Yeah, it's a bit of an exception. Um, if he hadn't have been here this year, I'd be looking rather good at the moment, having won seven or eight races. Lap 15 completed into lap 16, and the monotonously, almost boringly successful Ayrton Senna from Brazil is, as we are used to seeing him, very much in the lead on this, the 16th lap in the 20-lap Formula 3 Championship Round 5. And struggling along in his wake, as ever, very successfully but not successfully enough, is the ever hard-trying Martin Brundle in the blue Eddie Jordan Rolt Toyota. There he is. I learned from the Formula 3 days, particularly uh, <clears throat> the colour of his crash helmet. It was very bright, very bright colour scheme. And uh, he, he took no prisoners whatsoever. You could clearly see him coming up behind you. And he very often left you to decide whether or not you were going to have an accident with him. He put his car in a position to overtake you, and it happened to me in Formula 3 many times. And we did have many accidents, because I wouldn't let him through. When he came to us, uh, Martin... Uh, was one of those drivers who needed uh, a degree of help in terms of he always kept telling himself and we kept telling him, Martin, you can take him. At this stage, obviously, no one realized how good that Senna was going to be. So um, it was easier to accept it. There was no, if you like, big, big reputation about it. Here was just another Brazilian who was obviously going to be good, but not to the level that we now know. A significant day, Senna's first drive in a Formula One car, courtesy of Williams, Donington, 1983. Other tests would follow with Tolman, Brabham and McLaren, but this moment was special. We'd run a lot there with the car that year, with our regular drivers, and on a lap 11, his first time out in a Grand Prix car, he equaled the best time that car had done in other hands. And on lap 23, he was about a second. He was a second a lap faster than the car had gone. At that point, he came in, stopped and said, I think I've had enough today. 